Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back into the Buster Show podcast. Today, I'm very fortunate because I'm joined alongside by Dan Porter. Dan is a visionary, if you don't know. He was the head of digital at WME, then founded Overtime, has done a million other things, and I also watched me play basketball when I was like 12. Dan, how are you? I was wondering whether we were going to get to that. Buster and my son played in uh, some uh, middle school rec league basketball. I mean, Buster could dunk when he was 10, so he was kind of like a unicorn of all the other little kids. But uh, 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 so I'm happy to do this, uh, and I'm I'm good. I'm good. Stuff's happening. It's pretty remarkable that I could go from being able to dunk at 10 to not making the high school team. <laughs> That's um, it's probably the steepest drop off that That's any. Why you had to move out of state. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> Although I did the reverse. I went from private to public. The, the, if I really wanted to keep playing, I would have done the reverse. <laughs> you could have dominated on that St. Anne's basketball team. Oh, my God. Um, but, you know, it, it's so funny because I interned at overtime when there were, what, 10 employees at the yeah. time, which is... Uh, yeah, the Instagram was just getting started. That was one of the things that back then I was helping out with. I, I'm very proud to have hosted the worst show in the history of overtime. Um, it was a Facebook live show, but it was so cool to see uh, your vision because I don't know if you remember, but we had a meeting at the very beginning and you sat me down and you were like, this is what we're gonna do. It's gonna happen over five years. And you did it. Do you remember that at all or how your goals from the beginning sort of morphed, but how much has stayed intact from so early on? Yeah, I, I think it's like, I mean, the show makes me think about, to use a kind of soccer metaphor, like, look, we just took a lot of shots on goal because uh, A, we didn't, you know, we knew what we wanted to do and we knew which audience we wanted to reach. But, you know, we had to try a lot of stuff. At the same time, like stuff was, you know, things change around you, right? Like then it was Facebook Live, maybe it's Twitch, maybe it's Discord, maybe like TikTok didn't even exist until two years after that. Uh, and so I think if you stay consistent with the higher level vision and you're willing to try a lot of stuff, uh, then that's that. And, you know, I, I looked at, I looked at you as somebody kind of in our demo and in our audience. And so I was curious about kind of like what you responded to and what was interesting to you. And you always had some like hack of like what, what's causing things to grow now and later and stuff like that. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's hard to stay focused on the like on the big picture. And I think if you watch companies or sometimes you even watch people who are influencers in the space it feels like oh they're over here and they're all about this now they're all about crypto now they're all about this now they're all about that and they're just kind of trend hoppers and i see famous people um do that and less famous people and i think for us those weren't really trends it was kind of more like we knew there was an opportunity to build something that looked like a different sports network that was more in tune with a different type of audience with a whole generational shift. And so, you know, you're willing to try a lot of different things to, to hit that. Totally. And the thing about overtime too, and I'm sure what you've found is just that the engagement is so much higher when people can connect to a brand as opposed to it being, you know, I mean, you know, a Disney logo isn't a great example, but something like ESPN, right? You can't associate a face or names so much to that brand. There are broadcasters, sure, and they have shows, but it's different when you can associate a group of talented individuals to that brand. Yeah, I think building brand in, in what is like traditionally kind of media business is interesting because a lot of, a lot of, traditional media is about, you know, getting you information. So let's say, you know, you're a Knicks fan and, you know, it's 15 years ago and you want to read about the Knicks or 20 years ago and you can read about it in the Daily News or the Post or wherever else, Newsday, you know, all New York newspapers as an example, or a bunch of websites. But at the end of the day, what you want is information about the Knicks. You, you don't actually care about what, what that 
entity is that's providing you. And if all those went out of business, then there'd be three more people telling you uh, about that. And I think for overtime, you know, we wanted to connect with our audience and, and be the brand rather than be a pass through about someone else's brand. And even if you go all the way to now when we're, you know, creating our own league and, and things around that, like it's about building a brand as opposed to just building a place for information. Uh, and it's also about, yeah, you have to know people. I mean, you can follow anybody who works for overtime and you can see stuff that happens in the office when there was an office. You know, you can <laughs> who the different personalities are, athletes meet them. Uh, I think because social gives you this kind of window into something, it's almost kind of weird to have a, a brand that, that people don't know or don't know who works there or can't get their hands around. And, and that was definitely a goal from day one. I almost think of overtime as like, almost like a big influencer composed of lots of different pieces uh, below it. The same way I think of it as kind of like a big media company in some ways on the media side, but it's also composed of Snapchat and TikTok and Twitter and Twitch and YouTube and you know Instagram and all these pieces below it. Totally. Now you mentioned the league. Where did that idea spark from? Was that from a dream? Was it, you know, something that you got a text about? Did somebody reply on an Instagram story? Where, where did the idea come from? So it was kind of a factor of a lot of things. Uh, what one big driver for that was when we did our own event, the takeover, uh, almost two years ago in, in Brooklyn, where we kind of did our version of an all American game. Uh, it was a really good chance to meet the players and also to meet their families because their families came. And it was clear that there was a lot of dissatisfaction with the system. I mean, we're the only country in the world that makes you go to high school and college to become a pro athlete, right? Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, they're not like in 11th grade and, and having to go to college. Like they're pros. I mean, Luka Doncic was a pro when he was yeah. 16. Nobody's crying that Luka Doncic didn't go to Duke or UNC or anything else like that. So we have this kind of weird system that we've accepted, um, but it became clear that it didn't always work for the athletes. It was very expensive for the parents to drive kids around to try to participate in all of this. Um, all the programs weren't equally resourced for the athletes. And I think also because of social media, as soon as an athlete was big enough, everybody would hit them up on Instagram and offer them to make money the same way they do for any influencer. So it's kind of weird if like you're really good at basketball and you're in 11th or 12th grade and like you've got somebody in your class who's good at music or who's like very fashionable and they're able to make a living from what they're good at. And for some reason, there's this weird exception that you can't even take a dollar. Um, so I think that that was one big thing. Uh, and, and the second was obviously, you know, we kind of saw when LaMelo Ball went abroad, we saw people started to hack the system. And I think as any entrepreneur looks like, when you see people start to try to hack a system, you start to wonder like, oh, are there going to be changes in the system? I mean, you can look at all the people on Reddit with Wall Street bets and trying to change and Robin Hood. And the system can fight back. But if, if the tide is starting to go some way because people are saying, I don't like the way the current system is, then I think you have an opportunity to change. And we had that opportunity. And the third is, you know, Zach, I think really thought about, uh, he had that kind of vision where it was like, what if we were actually, were able to do our own kind of league and we pitched it to David Cern, the former NBA commissioner, who was our first investor. He told us it was a crazy idea. Why would you want to do this? I've run a league 30 years and, and he was right. But I think he came around as well. And I'd say the final thing is like, there's so many things that one is able to do that are different. Like, you know, the way that a, a basketball game is called, if it's on television, that hasn't changed in 30 or 40 years, really. It kind of looks the same as when I was a kid. The way people train, like there's so many possibilities for there to be innovation. And of course, you know, the NBA is incredible and they do a lot of innovation, but it doesn't mean that it has to be only from one entity. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities for us to do different things, including, you know, for the athletes, even on the kind of financial literacy side, on the business side, uh, you know, we want to find, you look at all these kind of athletes now, 
Kevin Durant, a bunch of other athletes, like they're investing, they're investing in Coinbase goes public. Like, how do you, you know, he's, he's a very talented manager and business partner who, who works with them on that. But what if we can show that to all the people who are coming up, you know, a lot of that you kind of have to figure out on your own. And I'd say even traditional high school is not that good at that. So I think there were a lot of opportunities to make the system better. Um, and I think that that combined with the idea of, you know, you know, the rise of all of these players and, and giving them a structured environment so that the audience who loves them can watch them play is where it happened. But it's like been two years in the making. And, right. and it's also been a, a process where we've had a lot of advisors who come from the highest level of professional sports who have kind of helped direct us in, into how to do it. It's, it's, not, it's not like we sat in a room by ourselves and we're like, let's do this. So we, we really benefited from access to so many talented people who, is, who have worked for almost every single professional sports league. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And you, you, know, you mentioned for the top people, but it's so important also because most of the kids aren't going to make it as NBA all-stars just by pure probability, right? So it's so important for them to be financially literate as they're making some money and as they're doing whatever they want to do and also be open to all of the other career paths around the sport, um, you know, long-term because yeah, if you're- Including playing, look, you can make, you can make six figure incomes playing in France, you know, in Spain, in Greece, there, there are many places to play. You can be a basketball influencer. Like there are a lot of opportunities. They're just not structured. Like if you want to go play abroad, there's not one single place to go. There's not a pathway. And I think for us, we're going to build relationships with every possible professional pathway for them. Um, so, so think about it. If, if you're really good, you know, my friend growing up was really good at music. He went to Juilliard, right? And right. Played music all day and they helped him find a place to play in a symphony and everything else like that. But that, that doesn't really exist for sports. Um, and I, I think there's an opportunity for it too. It's, it's really, it's going to be really cool. I'm, I'm excited to see it. Uh, now I, I want to talk a little bit. Well, also, I have to say congratulations on your new round before we move on. That's pretty extraordinary. I mean, to have names like, you know, Drake and Jeff Bezos involved has, has to be pretty remarkable. Did you, did you sit down with those guys and talk to them about the vision or the plan? Or was it more them hearing, you know, through the grapevines that overtime was, was next up? Um, it's a little bit of both. I mean, I think, you know, we get introduced to people via people that we know already, but those introductions don't go anywhere if they don't know who we are. Like if you're knocking on the door and you're like, hey, it's overtime. And they're like, what's overtime? It doesn't really do much for you. Um, and I think some of those people, you know, they're aware of us, they're in our orbit, but they're not sure where it's going. Um, and then you kind of reach that critical moment. So because we have a lot of strong investors now, every single investor gives you a pathway to reach more people. And I think that going from just, you know, being a distributed sports platform to now actually creating leagues and competitive and anybody can imagine like, oh, what's the jersey going to be like? What's the patch on the jersey? What's the arena going to be like? It, it, and, and they see how much the game of basketball has grown both in the US and internationally in terms of passion. I think then it gets to that next level. And I think honestly, people also like the disruptive nature of it. The fact that we said we're gonna pay people for their labor instead of you know, the NCAA. Un unpaid also. internships, which is yeah. practically what, um, what college is for athletes. Yeah. <laughs> and by the way, like it, it works for lots of athletes in college who don't play maybe basketball or, or football because they get a scholarship or they get an opportunity to get in and go. And so for hundreds of thousands of athletes, like it's a good, it's a good path. Um, not the same path. If you're really good at music, you don't get the same benefits. Right. Um, it's just sports related. But obviously if you're on television for March Madness, generating hundreds of millions of dollars for the NCA and there's a pandemic raging and you get paid zero dollars and you can't even sell the jersey off your back or have the rights to your own name. 
that just seems a little bit out of sync with how this country is supposed to work. I can say it's a lot out of sync. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm diplomatic. I, I understand. Uh, so you are the head of digital at WME at a very interesting time. You started in 2013, if I'm not mistaken, or around then. You know, that was the very beginning of digital. Did that position even exist before you? I would say, I think it kind of existed, but it, it wasn't necessarily synced up with the rise of essentially influencer culture. And so it's interesting to me now everything's about influencers, influencers, you know, Patreon, Substack, creator economy, all of this. And I think in 2013, you know, we saw it was really the beginning of that. And if, if you think about a talent agency at the core, what a talent agency really is good at um, and was, you know, good at on the traditional side at that time was IP amplification. So you're, you're a person who's famous. I can put you in a movie. You can write a book. You can be a speaker. You, you have a whole team that takes you and your brand and really put, puts it everywhere. Uh, and, and that wasn't really happening as, as kind of YouTube, especially, and, and some of the platforms kind of went from like, you know, dogs on skateboards to like, you know, well-known YouTubers. And you can think about all the probably YouTubers you watched when you were younger who started to break out and grow. And so when I started there, there really wasn't much there. Um, but we, we were kind of like, this is talent. And I, I think there was also a challenge in that you made money from being on YouTube, right? You made AdWords revenue, but there weren't a lot of other business models. And, and fast forward to now, and you see, you know, digital creators having their own brands, going on tour, selling apparel, like opening up all of these revenue streams that often can be bigger than you're just advertising. Becoming um, their own VCs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it was, you know, it, it was the right time in the trajectory of it. Um, the agency started to understand it and had an appetite for it. And I guess I was a good a good person to do it. And and I'd say the last thing that was interesting is that I think, you know, when I worked at WME and I, this wasn't exclusive, I think all of the agencies were like, these people are really big, they have huge followers. So let's put them on TV and let's put them in movies because that's what traditional media is and that's how you make money. And I, I think what transpired over the course of my time there is number one, they didn't always do that well on TV and movies because that's not where their audiences were. And second of all, they didn't, they didn't feel like they needed that validation. They felt like, so I have a TV show, like I'm big on the platform that I'm big. And so it, it kind of went through this mini phase of like, you're big, but now we're gonna put you in the big boy table to being like, oh, your table actually is the big boy table and that's where the audience is and let's figure out how to build around that. Totally. And from back then till now, I mean, you know, I think examples and maybe it's because of the pandemic, but the Oscars, I'm sure, as you saw, had record low viewership, whereas people like Joe Rogan get that many listeners and viewers every day just yeah. doing their thing, you know. So it's pretty uh, it's pretty remarkable to see how things have, uh, you know, sort of gone from back then till now and one could make a case that head of digital was a more important job than whatever the head of not digital was right well yeah one one is you know one is a massive market but a market that is declining in size and one is a market that it is is growing and it is it is funny that you know i think about overtime like we'll make videos or we'll do things where we get more viewers for longer time and higher engagement than sports shows that are on television in the middle of the day. And yet they might have a $20 million studio or they might have massive advertisers. It just takes a long time for people to get out of the mindset that, oh, if you're on a television screen, oh, then it's incredibly valuable. But even if the audience is bigger uh, on, a, on the phone and, you know, you look at a Joe Rogan or another example, like, it's not just viewer numbers, it's, it's influence, right? The number of politicians who, who talk to him versus come on television um, and, and, and stuff like that. So it, it takes a, everybody who is under a certain age understands that. Right. And 
slowly over time, everyone who is over a certain age starts to understand it. But if you spend 40 years saying the television is king, even when it's no longer king, it's still hard to convince, you know, there's been a lot of time spent building up that narrative. <laughs> right. It's a lot of people whose probably dollars and egos are both tied to the success of that medium. Yeah. Uh, and, and time, quite frankly. Yeah. And, and, and the single biggest thing that television has really, well, so first of all, you, you know that the average age of the television viewer in this country is somewhere in the mid fifties. Um, and uh, it's just a very different market, but what television did a good job of is over tens of years, they were able to tie advertising spend to direct rise in consumption. So if you're, if you're a car advertiser and you advertise on television, it's so connected that you can literally see the impact of that commercial on dealership sales. And so that, that's been years of kind of viewer information and, and being built up. And so you know what your return is. If you're a performance-based advertiser, meaning if you're you know, selling a product direct to your consumer, you can see that as well. That's why on a podcast it says, you know, go to buster.com backslash whatever. Right. Um, but for, for more brand advertising, you, you haven't been able to. And so as all of the ways that you measure digital have caught up, that, that will make it more comfortable, I think, for traditional advertisers to, to come over. Totally. No, it's going to be really interesting. And I feel like the great uh, democratization of all of this is just that good IP is always good IP. So you can, if you are on TV or if, you know, the Knicks are playing, the Knicks don't have to be on TV. They can be on League Pass. They can be on this or this or that, you know, and you can buy them in all four sorts of mediums. It's just going to be who sort of converts over the best, the quickest, the most, you know, authentic to their brand and organically and then how quick do they do it and how much of a presence did they have before how long were they building this and that'll yeah. sort of shape and you know obviously that's why netflix and amazon and companies like that are crushing on the like high quality ip front yeah uh, i mean look i mean when i was when i was growing up if you didn't get home in time you couldn't watch a show and now you can watch it on, on, <laughs> on demand but, but if, if you take the stock market almost like as a media corollary, if I told you I want to open up a marketplace business, let's say I want to sell sneakers or cards, but I only want to be open 30% of the day and I want to be closed on the weekend, you'd be like, that's kind of a weird marketplace business. So you want to go buy, you know, a, a rookie card of, of KD. Oh, it's five o'clock. Well, you, you can't buy that because the marketplace is closed. And that's the stock market. And you think about the crypto markets, they're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, literally five times more almost, if, if my math is correct, in terms of that. And so now you have, you know, you have an audience that is global, you have an audience that is connected, news is happening like that. And yet, you know, we still have this, you know, we still have this market that exists in this other thing. So whether it's the stock market or the way traditional media is, you know, or, or the other example I'd give you is, you know, when you're in school, you go and, and then your parents come for like your kind of mid semester update. And so they roll in after eight to 10 weeks. Oh, how's Buster doing? Oh, Buster's trash. I mean, he hasn't turned in any homework. And you're like, you waited two months to tell me this? Like you could have told me this before. And so on the one hand, we live in this world of like real time information and statistics that are happening everywhere. And on the other time, sometimes in in traditional media and the stock market, even in education, like it, it, it's this very traditional model that feels out of sync. Like why, why can't your parents log in and 24 hours a day be able to understand some metric of how you're doing and everything else like that. So, you know, it's, it's hard to change structures, but I, I think you'll see over time, all, many things across society will change. That's great. And it's great that uh, over time's name is also over time because- Yeah, exactly. What, 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 oh, is, is that is that true? That's a little bit of everything. Things happen over time. Over time in my mind was like what happens after the game when people are talking about it. You know, uh, maybe over time is the new, you know, during time. Who, who knows? But it, over time is the new regulation time. I like that. Exactly. exactly. Uh, now, 
I'm curious your thoughts on this because, you know, like any entertainment industry, it's very hard for careers to have incredible longevity. So I like, and personally, the average influencer career to be shorter than the average NFL career, right? NFL careers are notoriously short because of injuries and things like that. Influencer careers are notoriously short because of algorithms and being canceled. Uh, from your time at WME to now with overtime, what are some of the, you know, sort of not cape, like key, key indicators for you uh, that tell you this guy could last for a lot longer than everybody else? That's a good question. What, one thing that I think that people from digital talent will tell you is that oftentimes when you're looking to sign influencers, their growth rate is sometimes more important than their total follower rate. Like you wanna understand how steadily they're able to grow. So somebody says, oh, here's somebody with 5 million followers. Well, if their engagement rate is low and their growth rate is low, they might be dead followers. They might be dead, meaning that like nobody, they don't see the post, they might be fake followers or their growth might've been done. Um, I think that for sure, uh, you know, people who connect with an audience around uh, around a specific interest. I think influencers who have a certain level of authenticity, who aren't just, you know, everybody's an influencer, but very few people are Emma Chamberlain or somebody who's like incredibly real and authentic um, and, and drive a real kind of passion, how good they are at engaging that audience and how willing they are. You know, I'll give you an example from the music industry you know, a lot of money is made in publishing, meaning the people who write the songs make the money. And over time, the record label started to want to find artists who could actually write their own songs because the revenue streams there were much greater versus finding someone who could just record other people's songs all of the time. And so you want, you know, you want the influencer who is kind of fully uh, developed uh, on that front. And, you know, to be honest, like there were clients who had millions of followers and who were like late to meetings and they got dropped like 30 minutes late to meetings, like, or their manager was their friend and was not good. Like there's a, prof a certain level of professionalism. You don't have to go to business school to have it, but if, if you have it, uh, you can see why they would have a greater deal of longevity. And I, I'd say the final thing is if you look over the history of art and music, you can look at Picasso, you can look at Madonna. I mean, those were artists that went through multiple phases as things changed. You know, Madonna had all her bracelets and she was dancing. Then she realized that a certain style of music was there. And then she, you know, was in a movie. And, and, and same with Picasso over the various, you know, iterations of, of his painting career. And so you also realize that there are artists who aren't trend chasers, but they're aware of what's going on and they're constantly willing to reinvent themselves and stay relevant. But besides the metrics, I'd say it all starts at the core with those one or two first meetings where you kind of assess someone and you're like, this person is lucky, maybe they're not hungry enough, maybe they're super hungry and they have a really great team around them and they're smart and they're gonna make good decisions. Totally. Now, off of that, when you look at, you know, back in the day, you mentioned somebody like Madonna, you know, and even further back than that, there were only so many channels, literally, that could broadcast those people. So if you only had a choice between watching five channels, four were the news and one was Madonna, you were going to choose Madonna. And then that allowed people like that to reach insane levels of fame that, I'm curious now, do you think that those same levels of fame can even be reached, you know, in the next like five years from now, 10 years from now, people have done it like PewDiePie and like the biggest, you know, you mentioned Emma Chamberlain as well. She's a great example of that. But do you think it's going to be too segmented out because there are too many platforms, too many influencers? Do you think it's even going to be possible for people to reach that same level as the people like Madonna did? That's a really good question. I'd say if your natural if your natural medium is essentially digital content creation, 
I think it's harder. You know, you have people who are really big on TikTok. You have people who are really big on Twitter. It's, it's, it's much harder. I think something like music, like you could use Billie Eilish as an example. You know, she's massive. She also is like, I don't know, like 80 plus million on Instagram. Right. You know, if, if you're, and music is international, you know, it's global. Anywhere you travel in the world, you listen to your Uber driver, your cab driver, listen to the radio, and you'll hear songs uh, from the United States or vice versa. So I think it's really hard and it's a good question. You know, it, it, it's kind of like why advertisers like the Super Bowl. There's very little things where 100 million people all stop and watch or the World Cup. Um, there's a lot of fragmentation. My guess is that, um, you know, that music is one of the few places, but if you become hugely popular, like, do I think that, you know, who's bigger, Charlie D'Amelio or Billie Eilish? You know, I, I'd say Billie Eilish has a much better chance of being that Madonna-like person because while Charlie is huge and she's huge on TikTok and, and otherwise, um, it's, it's just harder to be kind of digital native platform like that, but, it, but she's got tic, TikTok and other people have other platforms. So, um, it, it is more aggregated, but it means that there's more, more connected people. So there's more space for there to be essentially more influencers, if that makes sense. Right. And it's also, there's a level of, you know, it, the most difficult thing to reach in my eyes is being bigger than platforms while also having high engagement on the platforms. Yeah. Somebody like Charlie is not bigger than the platforms yet. Yeah. She's on TikTok. If TikTok goes down, her Instagram engagement goes down with that, right? Yeah. Because it's not as relevant, top of mind. People aren't engaging at the same level. Um, and when I look at you know influencers and people that I work with or or have on the podcast, you know, on the influencer and, and entertainment side, the things that I always look at are you know the best follower in my opinion is a follower from another platform. So the people on Instagram who have the highest engagement are people who are huge YouTubers, people who are huge Twitch streamers, and their Instagram audience is the top 10% of their YouTube audience. Yeah. So they're incredibly highly engaged. So those things, you know, when you mentioned Billy versus Charlie, you look at Billy who has incredible engagement and her Instagram is the top 10% of her music fan base. Yeah. I, it, I think also it's, you know, it's how, how you touch people and how often. The, the benefit of music, whether you're Billie Eilish or you're Travis Scott, is like, I might listen to Travis Scott album like 50 times. The <laughs> same piece of media that was once created. And then there's a remix and I listen to that 50 times. And then it speaks to me and I'm like, oh, I have that same emotional feeling. And I don't, I don't look at Buster's post 50 times. Like, you know, I'm not, it's not, I wasn't like Buster's post is what got me through this period of my life. Um, and so even books, which I love, I, I often don't read a book a second time. So music is like a weird unicorn in that it's one of the only repeatable media forms. And so it becomes that level where you're able to get people deeper engagement. And I think what, what YouTubers, you know, figured out, and I, I remember when uh, Casey Neistat said, I'm going to post every single day for two years, um, was that if you can get in the rhythm of people's lives, or even if you're big enough and you, they know every Monday it's coming out, um, you, can, you can have almost like a, a simulation of that experience where now we're engaged and I'm just participating and it's like every, it's like every day is, is part of it. And, and, and obviously that's what's good about sports, right? You know, if it's football, it's like every Sunday or if it's basketball, there's like a high liquidity, you're engaged, you're engaged, you're engaged. Um, and, you know, being able to create short form digital content like that, if, if you're an influencer, is really, it's hard on a day-to-day -day basis like that. And it's sometimes hard to give people, unless you're really talented, the kind of emotional needs that they need. From it, I think the, the benefit of a YouTube in there, obviously, as a longer form, is you really get to hear people talking and, and live their lives and stuff like that. But I, I think about it like, to your point, you think about it like platform and then essentially math, like a percentage of X and Y. And I think about it as like, why do I care about you and wh why do I follow you and what do you kind of 
give me in return for that that has an impact on my life, on what I aspire to do, or you lift me up when I'm down, or you hype me up, or you bring me down, or anything else like that. And I think the best people tap into that, and then everything else just becomes an extension of that in terms of, of how they interact or otherwise. Yeah, I think the point you made on becoming a regular part of people's lives is so key. Um, and scheduling on top of that, because it's true, even with, you know, my favorite movies of all time, I'll watch them once every two years tops. Yeah. That's not that much. I'll listen, I'll watch a music video five times because I'll download it on YouTube and then it'll just be auto replaying and they get all those AdSense dollars on top of that. But, you know, that's why, you know, Justin Bieber's baby has 2 billion views or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Um, well, think about, think about like, what Dapper Labs has done with NBA Top Shot, and then think about what other people have done essentially with NFTs. So, you know, I might be Gronk or someone else like that, and I release an NFT, but there's no regularity. There's no community. There's no, now I'm getting an email. Oh, there's a drop. Oh, I'm in Slack at work. Oh, who's going to get on the drop? Who got what? Like, you've created a cadence and a regularity so that we're always talking about it and we're always engaged. And I think that everyone else is like, we need to make some NFTs and make some money. And then you have this one-off thing and there's no community around it. There's no constant programming around it. I, did you get it? I didn't get it. What's this worth? All of that type of stuff like that. Um, and I think that that, it, it, whether you're, you're an, you know, an, an artist, a creator, if you can build the community that needs to be fed with that regularity, uh, I think it, it it's powerful, but but if you don't engage on that regular basis, it's really hard. Obviously, well, it's it's also a matter of those people, you know, in the NFT community or even in in some physical communities who have no understanding or experience in collectibles. They don't follow the principles of collectability if you're trying to create a market, which are sell things for a it's very simple sell things for a lot less than what they're going to sell for in the secondary if you don't do that you lose all trust if you do that you build tons of trust it's something that kanye did incredibly well his entire life you know where you limit the supply the demand exceeds it like anything and then it shoots up in value because everybody wants it but they couldn't get it now you have people out here who price things at what they think it's worth and their top fans trust them because it was long-term built trust. But after they buy it, it goes from one ETH to 0.25 ETH. And all of a sudden, you've just lost $2,000 because of your favorite creator. And now all trust is gone. And that's not something that can be rebuilt. And it's because they have no experience in collectibles. That's why I don't trust the normal NFT people. Yeah, no, I think I think it's a really good point. You've got a part of what part of what making an engaged community is about is making sure that your community benefits as much as as much as you do. I mean, you you think about in concerts like the secondary ticketing market. Unlike NFTs, you know, if Taylor Swift has a concert, that you know somebody will buy the tickets. They'll scalp the front row for five thousand dollars. She doesn't get any benefit of that, right? She doesn't capture that, but she also can't do that because if she said the front row is $5,000, everyone would be like, Taylor Swift hates her fans. She only likes her rich fans. It's not fair. And so you lose some level of value there, but you also have to understand that like part of what they like about her is her accessibility and that she cares about her fans and she's not just trying to, you know, squeeze them for everything that they have. So there's a lot of, a lot of market dynamics in all of that where when the, you know, when the community wins and when the creator wins at the same time, you know, that, I think that's when you get velocity. And, and here's what I think it has to happen now. So let's say a, a Drake concert ticket costs $100 on average. What I think will happen is they'll be released at 20 to 40% below that. And they'll all be released via smart contracts that allow him to benefit off of second and, you know, third sales uh, in a similar way to how NFTs work. And they end up making more than $100 on average. Yeah, because the flip side of that becomes true as well in the case that 80% of, you know, live events as concerts don't sell out. And yet the prices aren't going down, allowing me to come if I want to wait or allowing the venue to be 
full. So I, I think when, when you build things with smarter contracts, you, you have a lot of flexibility. And again, that's another example, like I gave, like the stock market, like education, like all of these things where I think the traditional model hasn't fully caught up to digital capabilities. Um, and it'll be accelerated. I, you know, I, I think a lot about uh, like QR codes, like QR codes to me, I just never understood what the point was. I didn't get it or whatever. And then during the pandemic, when like New York City and other places allowed outdoor dining, they didn't want to have menus because like they didn't want to wash them. So all of a sudden you'd sit down and there'd be no menu and you open your phone and you take a picture of the QR code and then the menu shows up on your phone. And now it's like, I'm like, oh, I get QR codes. They're like everywhere. And by the way, like they, they don't have to print as many menus or if something comes off the menu, they can change it like that. I don't mind looking at it on my phone. Um, and so, you know, in each of these areas, what are those things that cause your adoption to go from here to kind of like all the way up to here, uh, right. which is, I, you could argue in sneakers too, especially with like stock X and stuff, just the verification against fakes. You could argue that with grading cards, like there are things that are kind of, you know, happening in the world at large or happening in the industry that, that cause the acceleration. And I think as an entrepreneur, like your job is to try to figure out when those are, like when those are happening so that you time it right. And you're not the guy out there selling QR codes five years ago when everybody's like, I don't understand what that is or how to open it on my phone. <laughs> right. It's like um, trying to be a, a musically star. Yeah. <laughs> Just could have waited four years. Um, but, you know, I'll tell you one interesting thing is if you look at some of the people who have been really successful uh, on YouTube, uh, Jake Paul, David Dobrik, uh, you know, independent of whether any of these people are canceled uh, or not, like they were all Vine stars right? Like they all came from Vine. And when, when Twitter bought Vine and Vine wouldn't pay creators, they kind of all left to YouTube. But if you watch their videos, their videos are essentially nothing but a segment of small sketches, right? Like, especially a David Dobrik, it's like he runs around, he does something, he cracks up, and then he runs around and does something else. They're basically Vines, right? And so they were able to take almost like a creative aesthetic, which is a bunch of short form things. And they just linked together, essentially what were our five or six longer vines, right? You know, and, and created almost a whole new medium from going from kind of one platform to another. And I, I'd almost argue if Vine never existed, that their whole kind of YouTube style, you know, which is high Twitch and whatever, probably might not have existed either. Um, and you'll see it in the way that kind of TikTok influences the way people edit, the way that people use music, you know, I think transitions on TikTok are amazing. There's so many creative people who do stuff like, yeah. you know, that you just can't believe in. And that will start to seep into other, other areas as well. Totally. And as just general tech gets more accessible for 14 year olds who just enjoy editing, you know, things like that, the... Uh, the skill level and the products go so far up because all of this time is thrown at new tech. And anytime you have more people trying to do something, the end product is better because competition is good for everything. Yeah, I, I remember in 2017, we filmed something involving LeVar Ball and LaMelo Ball um, in Vegas at a basketball tournament that happened off the court. And Somebody filmed it on an iPhone. It was really fun. Everybody wanted to watch it. And ESPN reached out to us and said, oh, can we put the video on TV? And I'm like, well, it's two minutes of an iPhone video on TV. Um, but sure. And I remember watching it on TV and it looked awesome. It was crispy. It looked amazing. And I was like, wow, like you can make iPhone videos that look amazing on TV. And I know that doesn't sound that revolutionary four years later, but uh, <laughs> it, it was really, it was, that was a moment when it was like, oh, well, we don't need to run around with big cameras. Like we're not wrong. Like you can literally transform the world through mobile video, which is accessible, high quality uh, anywhere. Yeah, no, it, it, it really is incredible to, to sort of see the, evolution of all of that. But I will say on the point of that quick hitting content like that, it's very difficult to keep that up over a long period of time because as they continue to do them, and oftentimes they're involved in like a whoa or an ah or a laughter reaction, right? That 
you as an audience member consistently get desensitized to whatever they're doing. So it has to become more and more and more and more extreme. And in a case like David, for example, things go wrong, you know, yeah. or, the, or you go way over the line or somebody gets hurt, right? Yeah. I, I think it's very hard or, or even I think it was very smart of Jake to pivot out of that and get into yeah. boxing and become a real celebrity. But you know, it's, it's very difficult to do all of those sorts of things that revolve around things that aren't education. Like if you're building content around dopamine hits, like we can even use an Instagram model, for example, if you're an Instagram model, uh, you need to constantly be putting out more and more and more extreme content. And if you're not doing that, your engagement's going to go down, but there's a point that that reaches where there is no further to go. Right. And then that's when things go wrong. Do you, do you think it's even possible to do what people like that are doing over long periods of time? Or is it literally built into the equation that it's impossible to do? Uh, no, it's a really uh, astute analysis. I, I remember early on prank videos were really big and there were pranksters and we used to, we would sign them because they were big and they were growing, but you would realize that the brands didn't really want to work with them. And that like the second that the pranks didn't get to the next level, it was, it was hard to grow audience. And so, and you can think about that in, in kind of the media business. You know, if you think about what was on the internet, like five years ago, like, you know, seven people who transform their bodies, six ways that you didn't know, like, you know, how to get abs in five seconds, um, and, and it's just, you're right. It, it's really hard to play that game forever. And, and a lot of times, you know, I, I think about these, there's always an app that's about like anonymous feedback or telling you anonymous stuff. And it always blows up. And I always hear, oh, this app is really popular in high school. It lets you do this anonymous or whatever. Or like, we all know how it's going to end. Like somebody's going to get crushed like the school is going to be like, we don't want this. And then people are going to be like, this is fucking toxic. Um, and so all those apps kind of go like this. And then none of them have actually ever been successful because they can't maintain it. And so it, it's hard to play that game. It's not hard to win at that game. I mean, it's hard, but it's possible. And that's why at the end of the day, you know, authenticity and having people who care about you as a creator and your life the ups and the downs is is the thing that that always that always works. Um, I, I was I was not to pick on Billie Eilish, but I was watching the documentary about her on Apple TV. I can't. I think it was either a, a, an interviewer or somebody said like, "Oh, like there's all this depressing stuff in your songs," and she was like, "Well, that's what I think about. Like, I can't write about stuff that I don't know. So like, that's the stuff in my head. So that's what I'm thinking about. And so that's an example of somebody who is like tapped into their feelings and using whatever their medium is to express it rather than thinking like, oh, there's a system out there and I can hack the system. If I, you know, if I'm like, if I'm mini Mr. Beast and I go on and give people a thousand, five thousand dollars, like I'm just kind of, oh, that's a fast way to grow. But there's nothing about you and there's nothing that's authentic in that. And at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's the authentic people. It's, 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 it's why you can make a Netflix show, Last Chance You or Formula One or any of these things. And in the beginning, you don't know any of these characters. And by the end of the show, you're like obsessed with these characters and how real they are and everything else right. like that. Yeah, that, that is sort of the allure of, you know, re real reality TV. Yeah, I mean, you think about what the, if you've watched Drive to Survive, the Formula One show on Netflix, I think it's in its third season. It's like, I don't care about cars. I mean, I live in New York City. I don't drive at all. And yet by the end, like you have these incredibly different, compelling people and you're like, what's going to happen with the race and, and everything else like that. And I think that's been part of overtime from the beginning, which is people might have said, ah, who cares about high school basketball? What's high school basketball? It's like, Buster chucking up some three from like his chest from like 50 feet out or something like that. But at the end yeah. of the day, like there's so many compelling and fascinating and authentic and real interesting people, whether coming from all over the country. And as soon as we're able to get out there and kind of 
tell their stories through their eyes uh, and, and their lens, the audience is like, this person is dope and they want to follow them. And it's way less about St. Mary's plays St. Raymond's and scores 62 to 59. And it's more about like, oh, these are these incredible, you know, young people. Some of them are going to make it to the NBA. I'm so in it to watch their journey. Totally. And I, I think that is a fantastic way to close this out. Uh, so Dan, I know you don't like to be followed on social. So everybody, unless you do. I don't mind. I mean, I'm TFADP on Twitter and I'm TFADP and overtime CEO on Instagram. But if you follow me personally, you just get a lot of dog pictures. No, it's never a problem. We had a, we had a dog in the background for most of I the know, so I know. for people watching on video, but um, yeah, and, and make sure if you're not following overtime yet, for whatever reason that may be, and check out the Overtime League, of course, when that comes out. Dan, thank you so much for doing this, man. Buster, it's great to see you. Uh, keep on keeping on. Always. All right. All right. Talk to you soon.